Well, this is going to be a different day, as you're about to see. Um, a few days ago, um, we were going to be talking about things like the, 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 seven, the, the seals and all these wonderful things here and uh, all the trumpets and so on. Uh, a few days um, ago, in fact, uh, two days ago, I woke up from a nap and said, this isn't the right topic for these guys. I've never done this before. But I think while Revelation is a critical theme, you're here, I think, to more, um, it's a more of a specialty. When I do a study on that, and I've done it twice, I've taken groups through it, but it's more of a special thing for people who really love eschatology and really want to dig deep into that. But in terms of your application, you're going to be dealing a good deal in Revelation, more with understanding or thinking about the various possibilities of, of the text than you are walkaways in terms of how it's going to touch your life. And uh, I talked with Dennis about this uh, last night, uh, just to confirm that. And he agreed that there'd be more rubber on the road if we do something like that. So I, interestingly enough, we both had the same book in mind where I would start. Is this for a slower class? I, th this is a remedial, uh, no. <laughs> remedial work, right? Yeah, no, no, not at all. It's not for a slower class, it's just, I just got a check in my spirit and I've never done this ever before with a group, but I felt that this is not what they really need because it would take another eight more sessions. And I felt that you're, the reason you're coming here, I think, is to learn how do I have a better life? How do I have a better hope? How do I walk with gratitude? And how do I walk with peace in the storms of life? How do I negotiate these matters of pain and loss and suffering and death, especially in the light of a biblical vision? of what things are meant to be alike. You see what I'm saying there? And I think that um, when I've taught it before, I did it in special studies for that particular purpose. And I'm thinking that's what I want to do. So Dennis and I came up with the same book, independent of one another. It's going to be the book of Philippians. I'm going to start next week. I'm going to do four chapters in Philippians. Then after that, I'm going to do other short studies. Sometimes I might do a psalm. Sometimes I might do maybe, say, the Upper Room Discourse. It might be Romans 6, chapter, six to 8. Uh, something I, what I want to do is to find something that is going to actually... What, what's it, what does that mean? How about Leviticus? How about Leviticus, yeah. <laughs> Out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> My, 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 actually, I've done this with, uh, with Leviticus. Sometimes you sign your name, like, you know, uh, John 3.16 or whatever. There's a whole collection of 3.16s. It's an unusual uh, number, but Leviticus 3.16, I've actually signed sometimes. It's, All fat is the Lord's. That's what it says. But they think it's my life verse. But um, no, we won't be doing Leviticus. But the, the idea here is that uh, I want to have something that will speak to your heart and something that will edify you. And I just, that's what I'm doing. So, um, and so I hope that'll be of help in, in moving forward. But I thought, though, to close this, this theme, I'm going to do something I've not done before. And it's going to be um, something that wraps up the eschatology thing. And it's going to be unprecedented evidences for the last days. So I'm going to wrap it up today by just using this talk. Uh, making a talk out of it. I don't think I've ever made it a talk before, but I just came up with this list of, of, of evidences that I have found. Um, and I say, as I say, the scripture references are supportive, but do not always imply direct fulfillments. And so, what I, in my view, I will say this, that we are living in unprecedented times, indeed, and we're seeing things that have not been seen before. It, it's re reminiscent of the text in uh, 2 Peter uh, that makes me, it makes me think of this. Uh, and in 2 Peter uh, chapter uh, 3, um, he, he speaks about this idea that um, the last, they were going to come following, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, uh, the all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And then he uh, uses, though, the idea of the creation itself, that the heavens existed, the earth was formed out of water and by water, so the catastrophic eruption in human history, that naturally the creation of all things, but also the flood that he speaks of as well. The, wor the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. Uh, as you know, First Peter even mentions in which eight in which there were, in the ark, in which there were eight who were safely brought through the water. Um, so that's another catastrophic uh, uh, situation. Answers in Genesis is a good website for looking up 
uh, details about uh, some of those matters about the whether whether it was a universal flood and that kind of a thing. But the point is, he's saying though that these are examples. The creation and the flood are examples of how God can actually suddenly and catastrophically in interrupt and change the course of events so that things can happen. So don't be uh, don't misunderstand what the day what the Lord a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a like a day, and He's not slowing about His promise as some count slowness. He's patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But then he says, it's going to come. And when it happens, it'll get your attention. It'll be uh, in such an event that will be unprecedented. And it will not ever have any been any uh, kinds of things that have happened before. So the normal mo motif is, yes, they've always been saying this in the last 2,000 years of the church. But I'm suggesting here that there are some things that in our own dot time, in my lifetime, um, is, have not been seen. One of them is the rebirth of a united Israel and the taking of Jerusalem. And Isaiah 5, 11, 11 to 12, and all these other texts, and I'm gonna get this for you, that discuss this very matter that, that what we're looking at in uh, the, um, the texts of scripture, especially Romans, um, if we go to Romans chapter uh, 9 through 11, I'll zoom in particularly on, on 11, that he hasn't neglect, neglected his people and that actually, ultimately, for a, t for a time, they've been set aside. Um, it hasn't obtained, but ultimately, uh, David says, this was a prediction that they will not hear, and then, indeed, even now, when Moses is read, a veil comes over them, but it's not gonna be the, so all the time. It's not gonna happen for, for, uh, forever, because he says, these natural branches were broken off, and the wild olives were grafted in, contrary to nature. And don't be arrogant, but it's actually, he's, he's saying that God can put, put them back in again. And so he says, I don't want you to be under, under, uninformed of this mystery, that you will not be wise in your own estimation. That a partial hardening, he says, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Because there's always been Jewish believers, Messianic Jews, as you know. Um, so it's a partial hardening, but it is a hardening, and it is, but it's also temporary. So it's partial and temporary. But he's saying that there will come a time when all Israel will be saved. And so what he speaks about here is the deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so he speaks about this idea that uh, you were once disobedient to God, the Gentiles, but you've been shown mercy because of Israel's rejection, because it was Israel's rejection of their Messiah that meant that now you're going to go into all the world. Remember this? At first, I've only come for the Lord's keep of the house of Israel, but once they rejected him, then it was the gospel was to go across the world and ultimately to fulfill a the Abrahamic pro promise, namely that through Abraham, your, uh, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And that's, that's really the intention. My view is that God's promises about the day of the Lord and about Israel itself and the, and the Hebrew uh, prophets uh, was not conditional, but actually based upon uh, promises that were made that they, and that the typical book in the, uh, like Isaiah or Ezekiel, Daniel, they had condemnation, but they also had consolation. They consoled the people and said, even so, there's a hope for you, my people. And I'm not a replacement theologian in which that was replaced, but my view is that God's going to keep those promises. And, and just as he promised that, that Messiah would rule from the throne of David in, the, in Jerusalem, so I take it that's going to take place. So I use one consistent so-called hermeneutic, one way of interpreting the passages that relate to the first advent and the passages that relate to the second advent. I take them both in a normal, plain way, not, not to spiritualize them. So I, I think a consistent hermeneutic means that God isn't going to do a bait and switch and change the, the rules. So the, the point is that ultimately God's going to bring all this about. So I say this just to bring us back to this idea that this is going to be required because if for things to move on from here, this is going to be quite necessary. Um, indeed, the second one I have is an unprecedented number of Jews coming to Messiah, as I've just seen in Romans. Uh, to, uh, I think we're beginning to see that being prepared. And in the last 50 years alone, there have been more Messianic people come, becoming Messianic Jews. It's been astonishing than ever in the history of the church. It's, uh, it's, it's growing very intensely. And so because of that, that's yet another sign of our time and the, the rebirth of Israel, of course. Um, so this uh, whole thing taking place in 1948 
and moving on from our time. So it's in my lifetime. I was born in 45. So it's an interesting thing what's all taken place in this time. Um, the third thing is the centrality of Israel in the Middle East and the world today. It's intriguing to me how the scriptures indicated, in fact, that would be the case. And it's fascinating now that that's still this thing, this thing the size of New Jersey. That's what it is, this Israel is doing things that are beyond imagination in terms of relative to their size and so forth. In spite of the hostility and the opposition, it has been unprecedented and remarkable to watch how they've actually flourishing even in these times. Even now, they're, they're second, as I understand, only to the United States in high-tech startups. Um, and and they, they're, they're cutting edge in the med, 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 medicine and other things. The, what they, in fact, the, the, um, the Jews, are, earn 25 to 30 percent of the Nobel Prizes every year. I'll let you work that out. When you're talking about 12 million out of, out of over 7 billion people, it doesn't, shouldn't work that way. It's 1,600 times more than they should earn. There's something amazing about the people of God. They've suffered greatly, but they have been given great blessings as well. To whom much has been given, much will be required. And he told them this as well. All these promises were made. So it, it is a central theme, and it's going to continue, I believe, to, continue, to be a major theme uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, our, in our times. Um, a worldwide Islamic jihadist movement is interesting because in Ezekiel, it gives us an explanation at least of why there would be a unified uh, movement against that. Um, this is an intriguing uh, uh, map because it's, um, you see, you're talking about things that were described as uh, Put and Gomer and Magog and Meshach and Tubal, Persia and Cush. And all these lands now, what are they? They're Islamic. There's an ideology that would cause them then to hate the Jews, and there is this antip antipathy that's be uh, becoming quite, quite radical. And so that whole idea of something that uh, I think is cognate to here, that there is a basis for that organization in Ezekiel, those nations in Ezekiel 38. A united Europe for the first time since the Roman Empire, because you, 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 Europe has to be united ultimately and has to be uh, brought together and there ultimately there will be one ruler that Revelation and other texts predict. And uh, so in our own time, it's always been, Europe has been a constant uh, series of attempts to reunite and to re you know, the, the so-called Holy Roman Empire and things of this sort. Um, but the attempts to make it have never been complete, never been uh, achieved until our own time. Uh, another one, the gospel has now reached every nation, and I think that's f fascinating. Now, when we speak about the gospel reaching every nation, is it every people group and people describe that, that difference, but the ethne, ethnoi, the idea of it reaching, and it has in our time, in unprecedented ways now, been to every country in the, in the world. Nepal was one of the exceptions many years, several years ago. I still remember when I was in seminary, and they, uh, I met this guy, Gordon Van Rooy, who had actually um, described how they were able to share the gospel to the Nepalese, even though they were in Tibet, and, but they eventually, uh, now there's a, a, a world, a, a, the gospel is there as well. Um, it's, that's unprecedented. The capacity to destroy the world for the first time in human history is not to be taken lightly. And we, and we see certain things in the, in the book of Revelation with the, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments that, in my mind, especially with the, set la the, the latter por portions of them, the trumpets and bowls, are not of anything that could have happened historically unless you're just uh, off, the, off, the, off the charts for just trying to make it something symbolic of something. But really, the descriptions of these things seem to have no actual parallel or precedent in what we're describing in the, uh, in that we see in Revelation. At the very least, though, we have never been able to do this before. So conventional warfare now um, is replaced by the possibility of the nuclear uh, option. It never happened before. Unprecedented and, un and accelerating global environmental damage as well. And there, um, again, te texts that uh, touch on that. But I think, again, the, um, 
whether you regard the issue of the global warming, that's another matter. But I'm, I'm t saying there are certain objective things. Uh, for example, the, the loss of the rainforest is a very huge theme, and it's a, it's a major uh, loss that you see. Madagascar has completely changed, and all these other places, and our, uh, the use of, of pasture lands and so forth, getting rid of, of, of uh, many areas that were used ecological systems. So that, that affects everything as well. Exponential growth of information and technology, Daniel 12.4. Um, go your way, Daniel. The, the word is closed up until the end times. Many will go in f uh, to and fro and knowledge will increase. And that's a great summary, in my view, of what's happening in our own time. Many will go to and fro. This com communication, transportation, information, all of those are exponential in their nature, you see. So we have to realize, though, it's not a straight line anymore. So many trends are now exponential in their nature. They're just shoot, shooting way up. And you can only go so far unless it S's out, and sometimes that happens. But in, most, in many of these cases, there's no point at which that you can back off from that. Um, if you just started doing this, just, just looked at plastic alone, it's, a, it's an astonishing, the implications that has for the world and unprecedented things and other uh, movements that we're having here that are going to affect us in extraordinary ways. Um, but so what you have here is this no growth of information and technology. And you know what, as a consequence, has happened again, unprecedented things in terms of social dynamics and cognitive uh, impairment because people are getting now this newer generations um, who are more in a digital era are not connected with an analog world and less and less so. So I see that uh, in my own grandchildren and I think many of you will see it as in yours as well, but what's taking place is the movement away from the analog world into this AI world that actually has uh, no corresp correspondence, but it's very, very engaging very, very powerful, very, very addictive. And it begins to get to the point where um, you're not even, a kid might not be interested in learning to drive. They're more interested in creating these worlds of their own imagination and so forth. And that's why I've said before that there are new phenomena that didn't exist before, uh, that where people are getting away from their capacity even to connect with each other, and it's more indirect as well. So these digital places where they go to, um, this is why I speak about, the, for the first time, the possibility of collective autism. Never happened before. You have a whole culture of autisms um, where they're not able to relate to other people as effectively as previous generations did. Collective autism, collective amnesia, that's another one for, for uh, definite for, for sure. Um, they, I remember jaywalking. Remember Jay, uh, Jay Leno and he'd do this jaywalking? And if they, people were answering these dim-witted answers, even college graduates and so forth, they didn't know, uh, they couldn't tell the First World War from the Civil War. It was an amazing thought. Um, what do you think it's like now? Their knowledge in our culture is, is becoming, it's, it's just diminishing as time goes by. Um, so what you have here is a diminishment. So collective am autism, collective um, amnesia, collective uh, apathy, and the third one is collective anger. There's, there, there's sort of the idea of being victims. And so this uh, intriguing thing that's easily nurtured and then amplified by social media, which become force multipliers for the very processes we're describing, where it gets you more and more involved. So the metaverse becomes a very powerful thing as well. People are spending more and more money to get things, to buy places, to buy real estate in this metaverse where it doesn't even have any genuine analog reality. It's fascinating to me, and that's going to continue more as well. Nothing's ever been seen of this nature. And again, I'm saying to you that it's been exponential. What's, what's, what's happened in the last five years is more than what happened in the last 15 years before that. And what happened in those 15 was more than the last 50 years before that. It just is accelerating. And so the, the process continues because it creates new <coughs> rules, new rules of engagement. And just, just the whole idea of the cyber security and the whole idea of, of you're actually being monitored and all of those things. Um, there, are, there, are, there are things that are going on that are unprecedented, as I say. An interconnected one world economy has always been this movement uh, that we're talking about here. And it's anticipatory of things and dynamics that I think were described in the book of Revelation and in other texts as well in the book of Daniel. 
Uh, the technology of distraction is an interesting one. Um, rapidly escalating violence and sexuality in films. It's amazing to me, again, you look at older films, films from the 30s, films from the 40s, and the ethos, the values, were so radically different. And it's interesting when we, we do things that go back into the past and we, we F, have the F-bomb far more frequently than they actually would have used in those days. It's an, so we're imposing that backwards as well. And we are kind of changing um, even great literature and re repositioning it into a woke uh, understanding. So they have to change everything. So it's, it's become a, a whole way of this, this, this powerful distraction Escalating violence, escalating sexuality, ex escal escalating um, in all in video games, the internet, television, music, books, and comics. Am I missing anything here? There's a lot of things that that were going on here. So, but again, I'm not wringing my fingers, uh, wringing my hands. I'm just looking and seeing things that I've not seen before and no one else has seen before as well. And you have to ask about the long-term implications that we'll have for future generations. And the implications are not pr pleasant to imagine. Uh, then just a few more. The loss of moral absolutes has become, the Isaiah 520 becomes the, the, the word for our time. Those, uh, this, this idea of confusing light with darkness, you see, and darkness with light who confuse these things and then actually have an evil conscience, which is an interesting process. I would, I would actually com make a comment about that as well while we're at it. Um, because this, this whole idea of the conscience is intriguing. Um, we've talked about this once before, but Romans 2.15 says that all people are given a conscience by God so that we can know right from wrong. But other texts in scripture say that we can sear our conscience, can't we? You can, what does that mean? To, once you violate your conscience, it's like a little bit of, uh, you're burning it a little bit, and what happens to the tissue? It becomes less sensitive, you see? It, 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 yeah, it's not as sensitive as it had been. What happens is a while, and you can defile it, and it can become an evil conscience. And an evil conscience I define as calling what is good evil and calling what is evil good. That's the world in which we are now living. And you do not see it in the past. I mean, that's the nature of it all. So what we see is the media and the whole world itself touting as values to be pursued, things that scriptures condemn. And whatever scripture condemns are values to be pursued. And so why would this be? And why would they take the high moral ground? Here's why. Because we have been given a natural conscience. We can't help it. We have an instinct, an innate understanding of right and wrong that God implanted because we are moral beings. We're, we bear the image of God. And therefore, because God is a moral being, we also have, are moral beings. But on the other hand, we also are agents who can choose to respond or to reject and to, to become autonomous or become instead Christ-centered. And so when we move away from those things and when we defile our conscience, the natural conscience can become, uh, as I say, a seared conscience, but then it can be defiled and then it can go to the final stages, an evil conscience, where actually you take the high moral ground on vilifying things that the scriptures affirm. You, you hear what I'm saying? That they actually think that they are moral crusaders, that the world needs to hear this. And that people, the Bible thumpers, the fundamentalists, are completely nuts in this respect. So the values have been inverted. So again, back in the 30s, culture, I'm not saying it was ideal ever, but I'm saying it was a lot more consistent with a general uh, vocabulary of a moral consensus in our culture, in our time, than there is now. There's not a real clear consensus in that. And so what's happened here then is that this evil conscience would account for a good deal of the, um, um, the, the hatred and vilification. In fact, there's a gracelessness as well. When people lose, they become fanaticized and as a result lose their sense of even humor or proportion. And so it becomes a, a, the idea of redefin, redefinition of tolerance, which once meant that you can love a person even if you disagree with their beliefs and behaviors. Tolerance doesn't mean that anymore. Unless you agree with my beliefs and my behaviors, you're intolerant. 
But isn't that intolerant of the other person's perspective? But they don't get this. And then they see it's a cut, it's a sword that cuts both ways, but I never see people get the other side of that message. It's amazing to me. So the most intolerant people are the people who in the universities are talking about tolerance. And so it becomes an ir ironic kind of, kind of a movement. At the end of the day then, if you're not gonna go to the light, you will in fact move away from the light and you will hate the light because it, it, it exposed the deeds of evil. Because in our heart of hearts, we still know that there is a God. And we still know, Romans 2, that we have, that we have violated even our own conscience. We know this. And so it's a means in which we come up with a narrative to account for and justify the behaviors that we're talking about. Uh, by the way, I, I add that a regenerated conscience can be called good, can be called clear, can be called blameless. So I don't, if you have, let me see if you have any questions on that part before we move on, because we're gonna have some time for interaction. Does that make sense to you? This is the reason why people are so energetic, so excited about uh, things that we're amazed that people would want to support, you see. It's just become uh, a loss of humor, loss of perspective, a loss of grace, a loss of forgiveness, um, a retributive mindset. So that's what I meant by this, this idea of a conscience and explaining that uh, for you. Um, so this, uh, that's what I mean in part by the loss of moral absolutes. And again, Isaiah 5, but also first, Second Timothy 3 in the last days, these are the kinds of things that you will see. Um, I would also add the new developments like bioengineering, nanotechnology, and robotics that actually change the rules as well because it creates new moral conundrum because the technology creates new problems we didn't have to deal with. When you're dealing with cryogenic freezing of, of embryos, for example, this is an issue you didn't have to deal with before. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, and in a world where uh, now even certain mainline denominations are condemn condemning uh, options for women who are pregnant, uh, it's, it's an amazing thought that they're actually condemning where, where these pregnancy centers where they're giving them an option to go to full term. Um, I, and I, I marvel at, at these kinds of things. So again, the whole culture has been moving in a direction that's unprecedented in, in certain ways. We just don't see it. But these raise new questions uh, about uh, what is it to be a man? Or, or what, is it, what is it to be human? And so uh, transhumanism becomes another component as well. A radical redefinition, of course, of sexuality of marriage and the family. And even the, 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 the Greco-Roman world did not redefine it. They just didn't live this way. And often they would have, it was very common for the elite to have um, uh, the pedophilia. It was a very common kind of a thing there in Rome, but they still didn't redefine marriage and, and, and this, as what, or gender, gender. Because all this, this fluidity now has become almost to the point of, of an absurdity. Just the last three years in gender fluidity has become where now you have to be careful what pronouns you use. You can get in trouble if you, it's like in Canada, if you, it's, it's the thought police are, are here and it's not been done before. And now you have to be wondering how you're going to address this person or this, uh, and, and this entity. And, um, you're, and there's this fluidity as well where you could be anything you wish to be because what's happened is you've disconnected everything from rationalism and empiricism. Everything's disconnected. And when you disconnect your worldview from reason and from evidence, you are in cloud cuckoo land. Your, your feet are firmly planted in midair. You don't have any basis for anything because you can't appeal to evidence, you can't appeal to reason. What do you appeal to? My own feeling. What is that? What, the autonomous self has no authority, you see. And it's the movement away also of vilification of external authorities so that traditional authorities are now are, are no longer there. So the, the whole idea of the, of the father, as God as the father, and then the, a spiritual father, the earthly father, the loss of that, and then the loss of the father, of the, the, the idea of being uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a nation, you see, my fatherland, you see, those three losses as well. Uh, new dis disconnects and this, this functionalities that take place there as well, the erosion of the family structure. And that's exactly, precisely what is needful to do so that you can now, in fact, inculcate a different vision of, of uh, a, a world that would ultimately um, be a global uh, unity system. A dramatic rise of intolerance and criticism of Christianity has been really quite evident. 
And you can anticipate that's going to be more and more. I've talked already about the fact that it won't be very long, already has happened in some instances, where a person will have to choose between their convictions and their career. Because if you're required to sign a thing that you cannot in good conscience sign to stay, stay on with the company, and this is becoming a corporate mandate more and more, it's just an inevitability. Because the, it's not that the corporations believe this necessarily, it's because they want to function in the world, and so they have to play the, play the game. And so what happens then is everybody has to be play, playing their game, but it's according to, they get to, to talk, define the rules. So then you are going to be vilified more and more for that. If anything, this demands a greater attention, by the way, to the church for us to really support our own. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to be needful as, as, if, as things continue to erode. But this redefects the redefinition then. And so the very thing that was designed to nurture, to raise people in, in a context where there could be a, a place where there's love and, and acceptance, those are gone, increasingly rare, shall I say. A dramatic rise of intolerance, then undegree, uh, un unprecedented degree of apostasy in the church. I mean, I, just to say it, it's how you can just think about what that looks like. And so churches that had a fidelity in the past to the gospel, have lost, many of these churches have lost their fidelity, and even what's called evangelicals now have become more in the area of a kind of a, of a deconstructionism, the woke movement, and all kinds of areas where, again, we're redefining the gospel. The, and the attempt is to make it relevant. And the, every time you try to make the gospel relevant, you make it less relevant, you see, because you're trying to make the gospel conform to the ethos and movements of society itself, of the culture, to get a better word in and make it more relevant. But in order to do that, you have to compromise the message itself in order to, to conform to those shapes. And so when it's reshaped, what happens is it's re-envisioned, re and so the gospel of Christ becomes something that's lost in the fray, and, we're, and churches become more and more concerned about these other matters that I think miss out. So that the whole idea of the Great Commission, what was Jesus a great commission to go and to, and to make disciples, you see, and baptizing them and teaching them. And, you know, so this whole like going and baptizing and teaching are all mandated, by, uh, modifying the, the great verb of make disciples. And so the church is, seems to be losing its mission in the area of discipleship of, uh, and of evangelism. It seems to be diminishing as time goes by as well. And so we see that terrible loss. And there are, of course, uh, areas of fidelity, but in growing areas of infidelity. Um, an unprecedented number uh, of false Christ. I have, a, I have some lists of these. I, don't, I won't give them to you, but um, unprecedented numbers of people who are claiming, even now, to be uh, false messiahs, messiahs rather. Um, and then finally, an explosive growth in capital punishment by beheading. I, I had to throw that in because I have a suspicion that the guillotine is going to be coming back in Revelation. A lot of beheadings are going to be taking place. A lot of people who are martyred will be beheaded uh, for the gospel. But the, but the point that I'm saying, that that's, so, so what, however seriously you take the, this list, I think there's some things here that, I, as I can e easily demonstrate, haven't been seen before uh, uh, 60 years ago. They're just utterly new and have not been seen in world history. So what, why, do I, why am I sharing this with you? Because I, my application for you is really going to go back to 2 Peter, where I started. In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, he tells us then about this whole idea of how the, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Um, but I, with the day of the Lord will come and it's going to come decisively, and it'll be like a thief. It'll surprise, which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. And so it's a promise that these things, this bucket of mammon that we build are going to be burned up. So what we want to pursue is something that's going to endure. So he says, since all these things are be destroyed in this way, since this the, uh, these, are, these promises are going to be fulfilled, what's his application? What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, 
because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, in other words, and there's this idea of those who long for his coming, there's a quality uh, that's a, a really a virtue, a quality of longing for Christ's coming. Maranatha, our Lord come. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Since you look for these things and should long for these things, be diligent there for your application to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, you see. So you need to live in a certain way in which you are ready for the coming of Christ, whether you go to him or he comes for you. The reality is someday it's an inevitability. You're going to be with him. And so it reminds me as well of another text of scripture, and that's from First uh, uh, John. And it's the very, at the very end of uh, chapter 2 when it tells us that uh, abide in him so that when he appears, it's a thir third class condition in the Greek, which means any could. And he could. Um, it's not a question of if, it's, it's just a question of when. We may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. So what is he saying? Live in such a way that if Jesus were to come this afternoon or at midnight tonight, you would not be in shame at his coming. Live in such a way that this is your last day on earth. Live in such a way that you are now asking what would it be like if this is my world's last night, if this is the last time I'm on this planet? It would be a wise thing to do. Um, and, you know, it, it knows, I still remember as a kid, though, uh, you know, this, pray, this prayer, um, and now I laid me down to sleep. How's it go? I pray my, the Lord my soul to keep. And then, if I should die before I wake, what's the next part? I hated that prayer. What is this? A, a, a kid? What is this about dying before I wake? I didn't have any appetite for that at all. So I stopped praying that thing real quick. You know, I remember that. That's, that's not, that's not what I, that didn't fit with what Dale wanted. That was my, what I was called by my family. My, uh, and so I didn't want that at all. Um, and really, what's interesting is most people don't want it, even people who claim to be believers. I had an interesting experience on Sunday morning where somebody was uh, talking after my class, and they were talking about, gee, I don't, this is, I'm not sure. I don't like to think about death. I don't like to think about heaven. What, are you crazy? I mean, what, what, is, what, what do you think this is about? It's like this Anglican minister who was um, asked once, what, what would happen, what, what is going to happen to you when you die? He says, well, I suppose I shall go to a place of, of heaven, of, of eternal bliss. But I wish you wouldn't ask me such, about such depressing things. Wait, what, heaven and eternal bliss, but it's depressing? <laughs> What's wrong? What's wrong with this picture? Because you see, we've talked about this before as well, that my desire for you is to cultivate an appetite, an aspiration for home. You're not home yet, and you want to build that up. I've done this before in this group, and uh, you can find it on the website. Um, but the point is, you need to be developing a heart for home and a, and a sojourn or pilgrim's way. And that's my true application of prophecy, is for you to be so heavenly minded that you will do more earthly good, not the other way around, because you'll know how little time you have left and have a wisdom to number your days and to walk before God in holiness and in integrity and in truth, to be a person of passion and a person who has a purpose and a direction that's going to follow. I find myself now actually anticipating home. I actually have thought experiments with my bride about what we're going to be doing. Imagine we were together and we were, were in a, remember this, we've talked about this, these, just these four things, getting rid of those four would be enough to make it wonderful. <laughs> apart from all the other benefits. Getting rid of the world system, the flesh and the devil, uh, pretty powerful. Getting rid of death, sickness, mourning, crying and pain. Those are the former things. And we're all stuck with that, aren't we? We're stuck with that. Um, I, I, I call it, there's a term that I use for it. Um, it's an odd term, but uh, propinquity. Um, and here I'm talking about closeness or nearness. And here you are, basically, um, this is about, this is your world uh, you've got. That's the, the, the red Y is you. So you, so you can certainly, uh, the loss of my grandparents was painful. The loss of my parents was more painful. The loss of my bride would be far greater, you see. And the loss of your children or grandchildren. 
But that's about the range. I, my thinking, I've never read this anywhere, but I think it's true that the, we can't handle more than that. If you could go back further, the pain would be too much to endure if you had a, a propinquity, which means nearness. It means how many people, so that all these other generations, you might go as far as your great grandparents and your great grandchildren, rare. Very narrow band compared to all generations. The amazing thing is, in the Father's house, we will be, have, we will be connected with all generations of believers. An interesting thought. Because it will be no pain, no death, no sorrow, no loss. Now, you can actually have a greater capacity for relationships than ever believed before. That people now who are very distant now become immediate to you. I've told you about the Ken Burns effect. Remember the Civil War? And one of the things that I had never seen before, as he had done, was to create that so-called effect where he just slow pan over those faces in the Civil, these, these Civil War soldiers. And then the second thing he did, remember? What did he do as well? He did the music, the songs, which were very meaningful, and then the voiceover, the reading. So you hear him reading, and darned if he didn't make those people have the illusion of propinquity, of nearness. You cared. In fact, a great novel will make you care. Great drama makes you care about people that you otherwise didn't, wouldn't have cared about before. Let's be honest. You may read about a train, let's say in India, and 100 people lose their lives because of, of a terrible accident. And you say, That's, I'm sorry to hear that. And you move on because it doesn't darken your day. It wasn't your, 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 your you didn't have propinquity. Then some, our, I believe our capacity will be boundless and we will be able to relate to, to all believers. I don't know how it's gonna be. In some way, you will be perhaps more intimate with, um, with people, millions of people you've not yet met than you are with anyone that you know now. I think the one exception for me is going to be my bride, though, because I tell Karen that we are, we are, in fact, going to always be together because we complete each other. And so we were called for that. And so that's why I found that the truth is always between her and me, sometimes more on her side, sometimes more on my side. The truth is always, and I ignore her wisdom to my great peril. My greatest mistakes in life, men, and you know this is true, is not listening to the person you've been granted. The, the other side, because that was what completes you. So she and I are a dyadic union that are created. It's an image of Christ in the church as what marriage is. And so there's a Trinitarian component in marriage because there you have um, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the love of the beloved and the love that flows between them. And so we are an example of that. So we are triadic really because we are both in Christ. And so I think we're gonna go on forever and do wonderful things. So I've, I've been playing a lot of games with her in terms of thinking about what we might wanna do. What, where you might want to travel. I do a lot of thought experiments since I love nature. I'd like to zoom down into something, you see, and to see it in its marvelous uh, manners. It would be an incredible thing. And so but what, what joy, what rides there'll be uh, when we have that. So um, I'm just suggesting then that all of these are, 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 are components then of this, uh, this desire for heaven. Um, the resurrected body that you're going to be in will be so incredible. Your capacity will be so vastly greater. Your co cognitive capacity, um, your capacity, I think, for pleasure will even be increased because we can't even manage the pleasures we've gotten. There are a thousand removes. But I think when we are sinless and when now the completion of our sanctification, we have been saved, we're being saved, we will be saved. We are already in the, seated with him in the heavenly places. We have been saved. But we're being saved, we are being sanctified in our present tense so that our mission in this world is to become more and more in our practice who we already are, who you already are. You're a new being, but you have to become who that person is in your practice. And then ultimately, um, all these things come together where you now, the two are one and the same, so that now you have this glorified, resurrected body that can have greater capacities for cognition, for pleasure, for relationships. Uh, in a resurrected world as well. Right now we live in a world that's recalcitrant, that's fallen, that's broken, and it's still exquisite and marvelous, yet it's also uh, pushes against your endeavors so often. There it will cooperate, time will cooperate with you. 
and space will cooperate. Nature will not now have a, this diminished um, experience, but even the, your experience of time and space will be doxological, not a fallen experience where it's taking your life and your vitality away. There it'll be your agency. And um, gardeners of the new creation, what do you think you'll be able to do in this resurrected world? The concept is, is astonishing. Think of all the capacities that you potentially have, all the things you know you could do if you had m many years, but you're not going to be able to do there. You will have, time will be your, your agent. And finally, in expanding uh, relational and capacity, because I think that we're going to be able to enter into one another's um, minds or souls and to be able to see things as they saw them, I think it's going to be quite extraordinary because there's nothing to be hid after the judgment seat of Christ. And that um, all those things that have happened, well, nothing no, will blackmail the joy of heaven. And then the expanding vision of God so that we will see his face and the idea of seeing his face. No one can look on his face and live, and yet we will see his face. Amazing thought. How? In that resurrected body. Then you will be utterly and perfectly complete. You see, then spirit already is perfect. You're already declared righteous. You're already perfect in him and your spirit. Then your soul, your thinking, your imagination, your desires, your will, your choices will also be perfectly conformed to him in that day after the judgment seat of Christ has been purged away. And then, and then finally as well, your body will be like Christ's own glorified resurrected body, an agent that will give you um, great joy and power and possibilities that are hard to even begin to conceive. Because as you know, biblical theism is the most incarnate image anywhere. It's the thing that emphasizes the senses, emphasizes being a part of this world, of being incarnate. And it's because the word of God took on flesh. So this glorious joy of you now being bearers of the image of God in a new um, creation and having authority and dominion it's amazing stuff. So it's pretty heady, pretty heady stuff. And so I think that that growing vision of God is just going to get better and better. It's going to be further up and further in. And uh, every, every chapter will be better than the one before. So we will see new joys, new things that uh, have not been seen before. Let me get your thoughts about that. So that's my, that's my wrap up on prophecy. But I want it to be applicable. After all, we struggle, don't we? We want to have, we, we struggle with these, these matters um, because um, it, it's this idea of identity. We struggle with this. We've talked about this before. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? These fundamental questions. And I'm seeking to give us biblical answers to these questions so we can sink our cap roots deeply into the soil of these truths and to know, I know who I am. I know why I'm here and I know where I'm going. And with that greater clarity of vision collectively, I think we can be people who encourage and stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Which, by the way, is my reminder to ask you how you're doing on Hammer to Prayer. You see, this is month two. And so the day of the month, you should be on day two, five. Give it a go. I want you to try doing that because uh, it'll be good for us to share perhaps sometimes, experiences that the Spirit of God may give us. I love the idea of reading the same text of Scripture and being together on that. I, I love that very much because if I, um, if I think about the um, handbook to prayer here. Um, so, so here we are, the second month, day, this is day five, isn't it? So this is what we're going to be do doing. And we, the, the, the idea that we would start with adoration collectively. I mean, you're together, you're, but, but you're on your own, but yet we're going to be see, reading the same text of Scripture. If you haven't got access, see me. We'll make this happen. But the Lord is the true God, so we start with Him. And in Scripture, it elevates our thoughts, and we elevate our minds to thoughts of praise and worship, and then the balanced diet with confession, and then uh, the prayers of renewal of petition, of uh, intercession, affirmation, thanksgiving, and always with a closing prayer. Um, and so it, so it continues that way. So I'd like to encourage you to do that again, to serve and to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And that is why we meet. One last thought, Hebrews chapter uh, three is very much along this line. So in Hebrews chapter three, this, this whole concept then is that um, 
we are in fact are meant to then hold fast, encourage one another, verse 13, today, uh, uh, another, day after day, as long as it is still called today. It's interesting. This is all you've got. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so this concept then of, of uh, enjoying that fellowship that we can have with one another. In Hebrews 10, it tells us uh, pretty much the same uh, thing. So that um, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's my best way of ending this. As you see, you're encouraging one another. Well, why the prophecy and the emphasis on those things? The day is drawing near. And you need to be encouraging and equipping and empowering each other. And that's what we were called to do. It's going to get worse. I can, I'm quite confident of that. There's going to be more adversity. But, uh, but God has called us to such a time as this. I've got a question for you. You were talking earlier about some of the things going on, like the nanotechnology and all that kind of stuff. You, know, you said the same thing. We have to make decisions, more decisions about some of those things. You have a, you have that friend here, James Tour, that's very involved with nanotechnology and all that. Yes. How? Where are the of those discussions going to be? Because I don't see them happening anywhere. About how you you know you evaluate some of these new developments. Mm -hmm. And you're asking. Um, you, you have guys like James. Yeah, like James Tour. Yeah, I think Karen and I were just looking at a little interview with uh, James Tour and having a discussion with Stephen Meyer, and uh, just love these minds. And great. The question is, how do you then look at? It? How do you speak into this? How do you speak into culture about the dynamics associated with these new developments? Well, that's what I'm seeking to do in differing ways. One of which is to. Um, monitored to note and, and common about them in my teachings as, uh, as kind of in, at showing attention to that because people are, are getting exposed to this and uh, therefore they need to at least have a biblical perspective on what's happening and knowing the times and how we, how we need to respond to them. And so indeed that's, that, that is the whole idea of, uh, of the, 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 this process of understanding the times. Um, and knowing how we lead. remember this slide about the idea what kind of person you need to be this is what it comes down to in part being men of character understanding their culture and and applying that culture so notice what's happening now this is going to be a tend tendency how do we live in light of that because it's going to have an impact on the way we live our lives uh, so certain freedoms are going to be diminished civilities are being lost as well um, and so know your culture, um, know your calling, because you have a calling for this little uh, re remaining few years we've got. Um, uh, lights in the world, and that light image is then to dispel the darkness and, uh, and holding fast the word of life, and then anticipating the day of Christ. How should we live then? We should be people who understand the times and know how we uh, need, need to live. It's like the sons of Issachar, you need to understand both and know how we, what Israel should do, know your culture and your calling. So I, in part, will, uh, will refer to my culture and re refer to these things, to tell them about certain trends that are taking place so that people are aware of that. Um, but I don't want people getting too, too absorbed in that because it becomes a dangerous uh, uh, thing. That's why we had the, remember the world to word ratio? Because there, you need to be careful of your own mind's eye. I did this on, on Philippians, I'm going to do it with you as well, about um, some mechanisms we can use to enhance our exposure, our thoughts, because what you're putting into your mind, you see, what you read, what you, what you view, what you hear, will have an impact on your thinking. There's no question about it. So if the ratio is so much more world over word, if you're going to be not equipped to live well, so that's why I'm, I'm seeking to encourage you, and uh, that's why the Hamburg to Prayer and other resources of this sort uh, that I'm alluding to. So, yeah, that's, that's so understand your culture, know what it's like, and uh, talk about these things. And we do, we do a little bit of, we do all these things, but in the context of the, the quest for meaning and purpose and significance in this world, we're all in that quest. What's another, another question here? Like these, these are excellent to go over. I 
if, if you have two years to live, I think that's what would happen. Yes, that's the way we should be living if we have two years. Where am I going to start and what am I going to do? Yeah. I'm going to be starting with my family, grandchildren, and grandchildren. And, and then you go over all of these things, and you've done an excellent job at giving us all of these tidbits that we can carry on to our families. Let's start there and expand from there. Yeah. So you have a reason for he being here. And, um, I, I think the best course is to live as if you only had one year left and then and, and treat this as your last year. Not a bad way. It turns out you have another year. Okay, now you have another year, so that'll be your last year. But to live that way, I live as if he's going to come in that time frame, but I plan as if he's not. So I plan if in case, so I, I don't want to be caught. I want to make sure I'm the, I want the last part to be the best. And I think all of us can live in such a way that the best is yet to come. And that's what my desire for you. You want to end well, you want to finish well. And you want to, but the way you finish well is by treasuring the things that Jesus called us to treasure and to pursue those things more above any other earthbound good.